Um, so my name is Chloe Robinson and I'm based at the University of Guelph in Ontario, Canada. And I've been working on the STREAM project since it started towards the end of uh, 2018. And um, I'm going to be giving you an overview of the project and some updates from our, our year one sampling. So I'm sure many of you are aware, um, globally, we are currently undergoing quite a large freshwater crisis. And uh, with Canada being hosting so much fresh water, this is a, quite a huge problem, especially for um, First Nation and Indigenous communities, especially up in the north. So WWF Canada put together watershed report in 2017, which identified a lot of watersheds which are lacking data, um, have good data or um, have fair data, as you can see from this map here. Um, this is a map for benthic macroinvertebrates. So these are essentially the bugs that live in the river sediment. Um, and as you can see here, for many Canadian watersheds, there are no, there is no data. We are lacking a lot of data. And for those we have very good data, it's mostly out um, on the West Coast. So with the no growing anthropogenic stresses and the lack of information, we knew something had to be done about this. So you may ask why we focus on macroinvertebrates for, for looking at our freshwater health. And that is because they are very, um, they're tolerant to different levels in terms of um, environmental conditions, for example, water pollution, oxygen levels, and other uh, indicators such as flow rate. So we basically can find different communities of macroinvertebrates depending on the health status of a stream, a wetland, a lake, etc. And so the three main groups we look at for um, good water quality to determine whether um, our system we're looking at is a healthy system are caddis flies, mayflies and stoneflies. So typically if we find these species, especially if they're some of the dominating species within a catchment, within a site, um, they, it's an indication that this system is, is very healthy. Um, but if it's very absent of these species, then, then that's an indication there's something wrong. And using this kind of information and working with um, Environment and Climate Change Canada, WWF um, collect data from all across Canada as said to produce these watershed reports. And the really scary results of how much data we're missing really is what um, promoted the start of the stream project. So as I said, a lack of, there's a lack of sort of a comprehensive nationwide monitoring protocol. So we currently there's CABIN, which is the Canadian um, Aquatic Biomonitoring Network, which is basically something that's run by Environment and Climate Change Canada, where they go out into communities, train communities how to um, kick net in the river, to collect bugs. These are then ID'd using microscopy. And this process takes a very long time and it's very expensive. But we also have um, other groups. So locally in Ontario, there's the OBBN and they use a very different protocol to CABIN. So currently there is no standardized protocol across Canada, which is actually leading to some of these sort of data deficiencies and some lack of data sharing. And as I've said, there's lack of data and um, CBM, which is community-based monitoring, so, or citizen science, is significantly underutilized. So we have so many groups in Canada, especially First Nation and Indigenous groups, which are uh, very, very knowledgeable about their watersheds and they have the capacity to collect these samples, but they're not being approached to partner and do this kind of work with um, the government, with scientists and with uh, professional bodies. And as I said, there's a high cost associated with the current protocol of hiring professional taxonomists to identify via microscopy, which is the current standard. However, with these challenges comes opportunity. So we've actually recognized and we can support and utilize this data produced by citizen scientists. As you probably are aware, to some extent, the data produced by citizen scientists is often questioned in terms of data quality. However, by using this DNA metabarcoding approach, which I'll go more into in the next slide, is a way to standardize sample collection and standardize the results so we can actually trust this data and put it towards a sort of Canada-wide assessment of freshwater health. So essentially DNA metabarcoding targets 
the DNA left behind by organisms in an environment. So this could be from their skin, uh, feces, secretions, or the decaying body of an animal. It, it persists, persists in numerous environments, so aquatic, terrestrial, in permafrost soil. And there's two sort of approaches in terms of sampling and analysis. So we have the bulk tissue approach, which is what we use in streams. So this is where we kick net, we physically collect the bugs themselves, which are sort of homogenized into what we call DNA soup, which we then extract DNA from. Or we have the true, what's classified as eDNA approach. This is the true environmental DNA, where for example, if you were looking at fish in a river system, you would say collect water, which will then consist of DNA from the fish where it's, it's lost scales, etc. So there's two kind of sampling approaches here. And for stream, we use the bulk tissue approach, because as I said, this is building on existing protocols from CABIM. The only difference is we don't ID the bugs, we blend them up and extract DNA. And it's, again, in terms of the um, analysis approach, you can either target a single species. So for example, in a river system, you could target a species of salmon, or you can use this metabarcoding approach, which essentially is targeting a whole group of organisms. So for example, invertebrates, or you can target uh, mammals, etc. But for this, as I said, we target uh, invertebrates. So how we do this, we use universal DNA primers. So uh, the DNA primers are basically short sequences of DNA that allow us to replicate DNA into uh, many sequences. And we use, we generate basically millions of reads using this next generation sequencing platform. So uh, the picture to the right top there is our Illumina sequencer. So basically this allows us to produce a lot of information from a single sample from a river. So compared to the single species approach, we get whole community um, information. And then we use various bioinformatic pipelines and uh, use libraries such as the Barcode of Life data system, also known as BOLD system, which has basically a reference library of uh, DNA sequences from basically a range of taxa and um, it's very, very well covered for invertebrates. So we use this to then ID, um, match the sequences to a species or family or genus level. And this has really been coined as biomonitoring 2.0. So this is moving away from the standard microscopy approach and it's looking at streamlining and reducing costs. So this approach, it basically, as I said, is a revolution, right? revolutionizing biomonitoring. It allows us to collect more samples across a wider range at a lower cost, so we get more information, which is super important, especially if we're looking to build baseline data for you know, years down the line, answering questions on climate change and other issues. Um, and again, it improves taxonomic resolution. So with microscopy, a lot of the time you cannot get down to species level, um, in, you know, because you have just mouth parts or you just have a leg. Whereas with DNA, we can get down to the species level with um, a large proportion of the data. So we get a lot more information at a reduced cost. And I said this was really first implemented at um, using the University of Guelph in the Hajibabai lab uh, at a remote uh, region biodiversity analyses up in the Peace Athabasca Delta in Canada. So this is where this was really standardized and samples were collected from a range of different uh, habitat type. So we looked at soil, we looked at um, from wetlands, as you can see here from the pictures. And essentially, we used this data to give the proof of concept. And we could look at things like food web analysis, and we could look at um, uh, DNA biodiversity reviews, ecosystem functions. So this really proved that this method could be used to monitor freshwater systems. And this was really the stepping point for stream to come in and take over for this nationwide approach. So STREAM stands for Sequencing the Rivers for Environmental Assessment and Monitoring. And it's a multi-stakeholder partnership. So it's comprised of the University of Guelph. Um, so I'm the postdoc on the project and project manager. Uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada, WWF Canada, Live in Lakes Canada, and of course the community groups who we partner with to collect samples, and to generate the data. And you can see from the right here, this is kind of a, one of our outreach pieces, which is a large part of STREAM, to let the community groups understand how we basically use this protocol to generate uh, sequences and identify species. 
And I did, essentially, it combines community-based monitoring with the latest DNA-based technology to generate all of this data, which is the first sort of widespread project, at least in Canada, um, to date. And again, we are working with Environment and Climate Change Canada with their existing cabin network. So they've been doing this kind of work for 20 years already. So there's an existing cabin database. And what we're looking to do is to basically add on our data to the existing cabin information. And we also tap into their existing network of community members. So we're looking to keep as many people previously cabin trained involved um, as we can. And as I said, data is collected directly from bulk kit net sampling by community-based monitoring efforts. So all of our data that is collected is collected by the community. Now this ranges from, um, we have a local group called EcoSpark in Southern Ontario um, that have been collecting data, but we also have First Nation communities up in the Peace Athabasca Delta. So we have a wide range of groups, including consultants. So we're trying to engage as many people as possible. And essentially the main goal of STREAM is to validate DNA metabolic coding as the mainstream approach to be routinely implemented by Environment and Climate Change Canada and WWF Canada and Living Lakes Canada for generating biodiversity data for freshwater benthic macroinvertebrates. So we really want to show that over three years, we can generate 1500 samples and we can basically begin to create that baseline that can then be used and carried forward for long-term monitoring. So here is our collaborative workflow diagram. This is consistent of the main elements of Stream, so you just so you can understand uh, how the different partners work uh, along this workflow. So it's an outreach and recruitment to training and certification with Cabin, and of course the community groups um, did the sampling along in conjunction with WWF Canada and Living Lakes Canada. And then of course all of the, bio, the lab and bioinformatic processing is done by myself at the University of Guelph in the Hajibabai lab. And then of course we are in the process of building a data portal and disseminating results out to community groups in conjunction with Environment and Climate Change Canada. Of course this is I believe one of the most important steps because of how we disseminate these results is how we basically recruit more people for the next year and keeping that communication channel open between us and the community groups, um, which then feed back into the outreach and recruitment for the next year. So for the STREAM project, the key deliverables are, of course, trained citizen scientists. Education is a huge part of STREAM and it's getting people who either have existing knowledge of their watershed or want to know more and give them some ownership and some sort of proactive ability to get involved with conservation of their local watershed. Of course, samples are a huge part of the project and we are building, as I said, the data portal to house all our data. We're hoping to follow suit of WWF Canada's um, interactive watershed report style. So basically anyone can go on and understand the data. You don't have to be a specialist to understand this data. And of course, we're looking to to produce a biomonitoring um, and watershed report over the three years to understand how our watersheds in Canada are looking. Essentially, of course, we cannot determine change over just three years, we need a lot longer. So essentially, STREAM is to create this baseline for a better understanding of river health. So as I said, communication and outreach is a huge part of STREAM. And for me personally, this is where a lot of my background um, lies. So I built a website, which you can find at streamdna.com. And this has all sorts of information, outreach materials, including a breakdown of the DNA metabarcoding process. There's a blog that's updated every other month. We have a news section and we're looking to build um, a vlog on there as well. So people can see what happens to their samples after they post them to us. And of course, the data platform that will start to be built now we have our first year of data. And we're working again with Cabin with their existing beautiful photos of macroinvertebrates, which you saw on an earlier slide, to create this interface associating barcodes, so the DNA regions we get from this data, with the picture of the species. Again, to aid this interpretation and um, to help community groups understand our data better. So in these next few slides, I'm going to be just going over how 2019 looked for us and where we're going to be going, or hopefully 
depending on um, status of the pandemic, how we're hoping to train and collect more samples this year. So in 2019, we um, promoted training events at many cabin field uh, sessions. So there were already um, five or six cabin sessions across Canada. And this basically consists of um, a member of staff from ECCC going out in the field and, and holding a two day training session where community groups come and um, spend two days basically in the river learning about the protocol and they go through like a dummy run of how to sample at a site and they get certified. So only people that are cabin certified get involved with stream because we need to keep that standardization of the data. And we actually held nine courses in total, which is great. And um, we targeted five main watersheds. Now these watersheds are a combination of um, watersheds that are already doing a lot of sampling and also a couple of watersheds that were lacking a lot of data. So for example, the Columbia River, there's already quite a lot of existing data. But of course, for year one, we need to generate a, a attention to the project. So we focused here. Whereas the Northern Lake Huron was a data deficient area. So we worked with Junction Creek here, which they're a local uh, water stewardship group. We also targeted the Skeena again, which has some coverage already. Uh, the Upper Peace, Athabasca region with uh, First Nation groups. And um, we also targeted um, some other catchments. Um, I couldn't fit all the photos on here, <laughs> um, but we had quite a lot of uh, success. And actually our, our aim for the year was to train um, 50 people, but we exceeded our aim and we actually had 83 people trained. And again, these range from consultants to um, government members to uh, local community groups. So we had a wide range of people that are interested in the project. So I think it was really successful um, overall with the training. And as you can see from the numbers of samples, our aim for each year is 500 samples. And we exceeded that by quite a lot. So we had 718 samples sent to us, which is fantastic. Um, unfortunately, a lot of them were sent all at once. And with everything that's going on, we have a little bit of a backlog now. But we've already sequenced around 200 of those samples. The rest of them, because the blending process takes a while, um, it's taken a little, little bit of time to get through the rest of them. But this enabled us to create some initial reports and do some initial analyses. And in terms of the spread, you can see again, British Columbia kind of had the, the one of the largest spreads of samples. Again, this is where most of the cabin activities already happen. So we see, see this as kind of low hanging fruit. So we can prove this in a place where we already know we can get people. But we did also have some samples from um, transboundary watersheds in Alaska. And we had some, some samples from Ontario, Quebec, and as you can see from the map, some other places. So you can kind of see in the middle of Canada, we're, we're missing some information. And this is kind of an area we'd like to target for next year, but I'll go into that a little bit more towards the end of the presentation. <clears throat> so I just wanted to give you some outputs to see the kind of analysis you can get with DNA metabarcoding. So one of the really important things I want to mention is that we cannot, currently accurately and reliably look at abundance so you cannot say oh there are 15 caddis flies in this sample but what we can do is we can convert so esbs so essentially what happens with dna metabarcoding is you get millions of sequences millions of reads and these are then grouped into identical sequences you can consider this a species so all of the sequences are identical are grouped together into an ESV, which is an exact sequence variant. And what we can then do is we can then say, well, out of the, I don't know, 5,000 ESVs produced, what proportion were, for example, um, Trichoptera? Which, what proportion were Plecoptera, which are stoneflies? So we can, and Hymenoptera, because obviously we get just general riverine species too. We don't just get the aquatic ones. So we can actually produce something like this, um, this bar plot here. So you can actually see what was most abundant in terms of reads in your sample, but it's not a measure of true abundance. Um, and this is a way to kind of look and see what, what's sort of taking up most of the, the reads that you're, you're getting. And a lot of the time we have um, diptera, which are the flies, which tend to um, dominate a lot of the samples. But here you can see some interesting species such as the stoneflies in the kind of the mint color um, for four of the sites were quite abundant. 
was one of the sites in the middle though it wasn't so much so we can kind of look at this a little bit but again it's all a proxy it isn't true abundance and of course we can do other diversity measures such as simpsons and shannon diversity and we can then look at site differences too so the figure at the bottom here is an nmds plot and essentially what this does is you can you can create a matrix of dissimilarity so on this plot the closer together the points are the more similar they are in terms of the the invertebrate community assemblage and the further apart they are the more dissimilar they are so what we often see if we plot out replicates from different sites is that the replicates will cluster together whereas there's often a lot of difference between site especially if one's classed as poor quality one's classed as good quality um, so this can change and look very different and this gives us an idea of how different community assemblages are in our samples and then I really like using this analysis because it gives you a really good visual. So what we can actually do is we can look at the different families of our bioindicators. And at the bottom of this, you can see uh, fly species. So these are often an indication of poorer water quality. So you can kind of see, well, if we're missing a lot of our good indicator species for good quality, are there a lot of indicators for poorer quality? Because basically the diptera can live anywhere. Um, and you can look at presence absence across sites. You can then, again, you see this heat map. So the darker the color or the more red the color in this case, the more ESVs there are. Um, and so you can see where there's a lot of reeds taken up by certain species or families. And you can also see obviously presence absence and which sites have um, the indicators and which sites maybe have the indicators of poor health too. So it's a really nice visual when we get a lot of good feedback from the communities on this. So in the short time we had to generate these samples, so we were looking at a two month turnaround from sample submission to report generation. Uh, we've sent out nine reports, and this is kind of a screenshot from the front of each of them. And essentially this has information such as all the tax that are identified to species level or genus level, whichever they require. And we work with the community groups to answer questions. So for example, we had a group in one of our river uh, sub watershed areas that were asking we have whirling disease which is a disease of salmon you know we know this species of worm is a host can you see if you can find that worm in the sample so we had four samples from around the area and one of these samples was most definitely in the area where there was whirling disease and this very particular species of worm was identified down to the species level just at this site but not say 500 meters up or downstream so this again confirmed the already known red uh, status of whirling disease there and other groups have had other questions such as you know this site has been restored this site hasn't can you look at the differences in in community assemblage so we can actually work with the communities and answer really specific questions and tailor these reports to them and of course we're always updating our bioinformatic pipelines and um, rerunning our data as soon as more species are classified to give them the most up-to-date information and in 2019, we published some papers relating to all of this prior work that we, um, or the Hajibabai lab in particular, did to uh, optimize this protocol. And um, we presented at conferences, and there's been lots of website blogs. And also, um, we've just worked, finished working with Living Lakes Canada, who published a fantastic short four minute film on the stream project which you can find there's a link there but if you were to just type into um youtube uh, living lakes canada stream project um you'll be able to watch a really nice four minute film that was professionally commissioned and um, that gives a lot of information on the project and allows us to um, share this with other community groups to gain more interest for 2020. so again depending on whether we can actually get out in the river to train people we have some new um, partner groups for 2020, including most of these are in data deficient areas in the Ottawa watershed, Lake Superior watershed, the Yukon, uh, Winnipeg, Fraser, and again, we're continuing with uh, EcoSpark and um, some other groups in Southern Ontario. Um, so we're looking to, and we already have maxed out our capacity for 2020. So a lot of these groups will actually sample in 2021. So we have a lot of interest, which is great news. And we're looking to hopefully extend the project beyond um, 2021, if funding allows. And as the data grows and as the years go by, 
we're hoping to increase the temporal aspect of this project. So we're hoping to look at sort of a time series of the same sites have been sampled for two or three years. And we're looking to infer using some latest models, some ecological functions of uh, the stream project and the data that we produce and um, to see how the ecological functions are changing over time. And this is the people I'd like to acknowledge that I work co really closely with at University of Guelph and beyond. And if you'd like some more information on the stream project, um, we are on Instagram, we have our website and we have um, a Twitter and an email address and my Twitter's on the, the title page. So thank you very much for listening and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks very, <coughs> oh, excuse me, sorry. Thanks very much for that, Chloe. That was really, really interesting. Um, I, I do have a question, but I'm gonna mm -hmm. see, does anyone else have a question before I ask mine? Nope. Okay, so, um, so yeah, so you were talking about, or you mentioned about uh, citizen science. Mm -hmm. And so I was just wondering, you know, if, if anybody wanted to get involved, what would be the best way of approaching that? So the best way um, of getting involved is basically to send an email to the stream or you can find us on Twitter, as I said. Um, and the process of getting involved, essentially, I'm main point of contact. And then I can put you in touch with um, basically all well, our training is being conducted by Living Lakes Canada. So now I can get you in touch with Living Lakes Canada to get you set up with and understand the training process. Um, in terms of costs, the only actual cost to anyone taking part is the training, which is offered at a heavily 60% discounted rate. So it's only, I think, 150 Canadian dollars to have the training. Um, and then after that, there's no cost. So the equipment's provided, the sample is analysed. So we're funded by Genome Canada and Ontario Genomics. So they've covered the sample cost. So essentially the main point is to contact me first of all and then the, we've got a really strong chain of communication down to the training and sampling design question level. Oh, that's really great. Um, it, you know, it seems really nice and straightforward. Mm -hmm. um, so Sam, who is also involved in the Sem Village, um, mm -hmm. is asking how difficult is it to map sequence reads from your samples to absolute numbers of organisms from different species? Yeah, so that's at the moment, I know that there's been some work to do this. So there's been some studies in with um, carp in closed system, for example, ponds, um, who have managed to sort of map biomass with the numbers of reads, mm -hmm. um, or the um, sort of the signature of the DNA, because it depends what approach people take. But it's very difficult actually to look at um, the exact number of organisms, just because you may have a leg of something which may be for example the same size that leg may be the same size as a whole body of something else so it's really hard to know exactly what you have in your sample to know how many individuals of that you said you might just have one really big crayfish in your sample that takes up 50 percent of the reads but that doesn't necessarily mean that you have mostly crayfish in your sample it's just the way that it, it works so it's very difficult i know some groups have been working on this for many many years and I think as technology advances, we're going to be able to do this eventually, but it needs a lot of ground truthing and there's just so much variability involved. I can't see it happening anytime soon, um, but it definitely is something for, you know, as NovaSeq is one of the latest sequencing technologies and we're being able to look closely, more closely at what we get out of this data. So eventually it will happen, but it's very difficult. That, <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Um, yeah, that totally makes sense. You know, I mean, I think the fact that you can do what you're doing at all is is really impressive. Yeah, um, it's like yeah, CSI of the river. It's quite fun. <laughs> <laughs> that's a really good way of, of uh, calling it. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, it's that's super interesting. Well, thank you again, very very much. Thank um, you. So yeah, um, if anyone has any extra questions for Chloe, um, then you can contact her through Twitter. Um, sorry, Chloe, what's your Twitter handle, just in case people don't know? It, it's at CVRobinson92. Great. And then also, um, if you use the hashtag stemvillage20. So, um, yeah, thanks, Chloe. And now Thank we'll hand over to Keris uh, in just one moment.
Hello. Okay, you should be good, good to go, Karis.